free, but uh, it actually starts way before that. Um, I'm an artist by training. The only school that I ever went to for creating creative things, uh, I went to a fine art school in Savannah, Georgia called Savannah College of Art and Design. Uh, and I worked my way through it the hard way. Uh, and uh, I finished a four year college degree in three years but it was a Bachelor of Fine Art, and that had no computers. Uh, Mike, had, can I just yeah. interrupt for a minute? I'm having sure. a hard time hearing. Is, does, is the volume, can you guys hear him okay? Can, can you guys hear me? We can hear him just fine. Everybody can hear him okay, so it must be just my computer. Yeah, I turned right. your, your volume down so you couldn't hear our secret conversation, Dr. <laughs> okay. Uh, so anyway, uh, I, I've got a degree in fine arts, and what that means is I knew how to paint, and I knew how to draw, and I knew how to sculpt. I didn't know how to make video games. And I got married right out of college and had a kid and bought a house, and I worked uh, for a print shop. And then on the, as a side hustle, I did art. And I was in Florida down near Orlando, so I would go and do art for, like, advertising and guys who were doing stuff for the tourists and whatever I could hustle up, right? And this is an important lesson for you. So you guys are, are coming up on the years where you'll be looking for your first real jobs in industries that you, in businesses that you want to go into. And one of my rules was, as part of the side hustle, is if you were my friend, you had to have one of my business cards in your wallet with you at all times. That was the rule, right? Because I never knew where the next money was going to come from. Never knew where the next gig was going to come from. And then one day I got a call from a friend. He ran a comic book store because I'm a huge nerd, right? And um, he said, Mike, we had these guys come in. They're desperate. They're looking for an artist who knows science fiction and who knows military stuff. Well, I grew up in the Army. My dad's a retired uh, Army officer. And my grandfather's a retired Army officer. So I knew military stuff. And I love science fiction because, again, I'm a huge nerd. And uh, I said, well, that's great. And he said, well, I gave him your, your business card that I keep on me at all times. And I'm like, excellent, you're still my friend. And uh, they called me that afternoon and said, hey, you were recommended to us and we'd like to see your portfolio. And uh, for those of you who've never done a portfolio, portfolio in this case is a bunch of different art pieces I've done. So they can kind of look through like a little mini museum and see what you've done. Well, I had... Asked, asked a bunch of questions of my friend and they were, they were guys who were making a video game for the first time. And uh, they had never done it before, but they were engineers who used to work for a defense company down in Florida. And they were starting their own company and they were making a, a science fiction tank game. So I went to my drawing board and I drew a science fiction tank as fast as I could in perspective and you know, everything else like that. Just an ink drawing and put it in my portfolio. I said, well, we'll just see, we'll see what happens. So I went and met with them, showed them my portfolio, and they got to that tank. And they said, this is exactly what we want for our game. Would you come and work for us? And they offered me really decent money, I thought at the time. I thought it was like, wow, that's, that's more money than I'm making working for a print shop. Uh, let's see, someone needs to get in. Louis, Louis Lee needs to come in. Okay, anyway. Um, I took the job. And by the end of the first project I'd worked there on, I'd, I'd gone from being their concept artist, a guy who draws up what the game is supposed to look like, to being their lead game designer. As it turned out, because I grew up in the military and my dad was a U.S. Army Ranger and taught small unit tactics, and I'm a huge nerd, so I played board games and chess and all this sort of stuff. Uh, I, have, I have a very good tactical mind. I have a good organizational mind for game design. And so by the end of the first project, I became lead game designer for the company because the guy who was in charge, who was one of the company owners, didn't know the first thing about how to design a game. And so I've been doing that ever since. And so the first game I did uh, release was Tiger Shark, then Slave Zero, which was a giant robot game for the Dreamcast. Uh, and PC, then, and then actually this is out of order, but uh, uh, most recently I did Never Alone, which was for the PlayStation 3, 4, and Xbox uh, 360 and Xbox X, or Xbox One. Uh, the Duke Nukem Time to Kill on PlayStation 
and PC. Then I did all the Metroid Prime games, which is Trilogy, Metroid Prime 1, 2, and 3. Uh, and those all were Game of the Year games and sold millions and millions and millions of copies. I did uh, Donkey Kong Country Returns and then the newest Doom game that came out in 2016. Now, what I did in those was I did the game design, which means I came up with the whole design. I did AI design, which means I came up with how the entities are supposed to function inside the game. I scripted a lot of the gameplay by hand. Uh, Metroid Prime 1, 90% of the gameplay in that entire game is stuff that I scripted by hand. So I, all those things that I did in those games, audio design, particle design, game design, concept art, 3D art, script writing, making movies, I taught myself, right? And most of this that I taught myself was before YouTube, before there were any things you could We had to make our own game engines. There was no Unity. There was no Unreal you could license easily. Uh, so we actually made our own engines and created our own games. And we did this without any of the advantages that you've got right now. So you guys coming into this sort of technology pool have some of the best tools that anyone's ever come up with. And they're free. If I had those tools when I started, my life would have been a lot easier. To date, I've sold about... I think last I checked, 35 million games. I've got a couple who've been in the Smithsonian Museum of Arts exhibit on art of video games. Uh, two of my games have won British awards for film and television arts. I think I've done 12 game of the year awards, maybe more, I've lost kind of track. Um, best action game, best studio, best two best rookie studio. Um, and it's all because I'm hard headed and I like learning new stuff. And uh, at my heart, I like creating things. It's not just about being an artist. It's about creating stuff that people can, can learn from and play with. And so a few years ago, uh, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do next because I, I really don't have anything left to prove in video games, right? I've done a bunch of hit games, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and, and I've learned pretty much everything that, they, that I thought they had to teach me. And Booz Allen Hamilton, approached me about coming in and, and building them some capability. And I was acquainted with virtual reality. I had been at id Software when we were making Doom, uh, when the first Oculus uh, Rift prototype was in there and Carmack was looking at it. And so I was well acquainted with it and I came into Booz Allen Hamilton and realized that there was a whole bunch of opportunity that was gonna be opening up, not just in the defense market, but in, in all of industry around virtual reality and augmented reality. And so I pitched Booz Allen that we would go in and build a real capability inside the firm. Now to give you an idea what the firm's like, it's like 106, 108 years old. It's the oldest of all defense firms. It's got 27,000 employees worldwide. And they originated the whole idea of what being a defense consultant was. So they were as defense consultant as you could be defense consultant, like super, you know, narrow bureaucracy, you know, government contracting. And the notion of, of making video games, you know, I may as well have been saying, hey, we're going to be a, we're going to open a discotheque inside the firm. You know, from their perspective, it was kind of crazy talk. And we had to convince them that there was real opportunity coming up and that in order for us to succeed in changing how the firm views technology, we had to change the way we approached it. And so um, over the past, I guess, five and a half years, I've been with a firm, almost six, we've built four complete game studios with more than 250 game developers on board. And I'm out of Austin now, so I'm, I'm down in Austin and we're the hub. We're, we're a part of what's called a strategic innovation group. So our function is to play with all the toys, figure out what toys are cool, which toys work best, and then we spread that information out to the other uh, studios. I'm gonna share a couple things here with you if I can get this to work. Uh, and I'll show you a couple things that we are doing. So this is, uh, can you see this picture of this lobby? 
Raise your hand if you can see it. All right, can you? Anybody? There we, we go. All right. Are oh, you still see the PowerPoint? Yeah, yeah, we just see the PowerPoint. You might have to share. Okay, your let me screen. let me close the PowerPoint and see if uh, I can. Yeah, I get think this you have to, to like restart the stream or whatever the screen uh, share. Let's see. Well, let me re let me reshare. We're gonna have to do this stone knives and bearskins, guys. All right, let's see. Here we go. Let's share this one. Can you see it now? Yeah, we can see it now. All right, this is the entry to my office at, at the office. <laughs> so it's all science fiction. It's all goofy. You can see there's a stormtrooper at our front desk. He's not mean. He answers questions pretty well. Full tech area. We've got a whole wing of this facility where we actually have like all sorts of cool high tech stuff. Uh, we've got haptic recoil systems to, to simulate uh, small arms for soldiers that are that track in virtual reality and do recoil and do all sorts of things like that. We've got um, 3D scanners, lasers. We've got hologram emitters. We've got you know just all sorts of crazy stuff. Let's see if I can show the next thing. I, mean, I think I'm gonna have to do this one at a time, guys. So just bear with me. Uh, and just so you know, I've kind of always been a nut. This is me as a uh, as a kid. I haven't drifted that far. I don't smoke anymore, though. I had to give it up after a while. <laughs> Let's see. Now, video games will take you, and, and technology in general, and I'll show you one of one of my sketches. So this is uh, I do a lot of science fiction design work. So just to give you an idea that to show you that um, this is a 15 minute pen and ink sketch I did for a company for a spaceship design. That's all freehand. That's just me scribbling, right? And this kind of stuff, this kind of me scribbling, something as simple as this, gave me a 30-year career in video games where I'm traveling around the world meeting interesting people and doing crazy things I never thought I'd have a chance to do. Um, among those crazy things, we're, we're going to foreign countries and going to places like this is actually up near the North Pole. So I went up to Barrow, Alaska, which is the northernmost inhabited point on Earth up on the Arctic Ocean. On the right on the edge, uh, and I did a project with the Inupiaq uh, Native American people up there, and the and the uh, Alaska Native Tribal Council out of uh, out of Anchorage. So we did a game where we actually took one of the native storytellers and some of their people and wrapped them into our production process, and made a game called Never Alone that was about Inupiaq myth. And so we had all these fantastical things going on. And we, we had a, an actual native storyteller crafting our story internally to it. I never thought I'd go up there. And by the way, where I'm standing in that picture, negative 55 degrees plus wind. It was so cold that, that every single inch of me was screaming at me while I was, out, I was out of the car and ran out here to take my picture on the Arctic ice. That's actually, I'm standing over the Arctic Ocean, was saying, you're dying, Mike. Time to get back in the car. So we, we ran out there, took the picture, and then ran back to get back in the car. Uh, never in my wildest dreams, getting an art degree, would I have thought that I would go places like that. And uh, I know you guys have been working on some uh, medical virtual reality applications, and some of you are interested in, in medical technology. And this is kind of a preface for where I want to go with this next. This is something we built in five weeks with four of our team members for the Centers uh, for Disease Control and Prevention. And uh, let me know when you can see this. You'll see a virtual laboratory. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, yes, so the, fr the frame rate may be really lousy on this, so bear with me. Uh, this actually runs at 90 frames per second in real time. 
but uh, the video stream may be a little bit, a little bit sad. So we built a hands-on training lab for the CDC, for their biomedical safety cabinet, how to actually maintain the cabinet and utilize the cabinet uh, in real time. Now we did this whole thing from scratch in six weeks with four of our teammates. Five, five if you count our tester. Now this is actually being bundled in right now with every single biomedical safety cabinet that the CDC is releasing. Uh, and in fact, they want us to do a version two for it. So the skills that I learned from making video games, which grew out of me being an artist of all things, are now building things that will save people's lives and advance medical science. And the teams and all the skills, and I worked with, uh, I worked with Nintendo directly for 12 years. I got to work with Shigeru Miyamoto, who uh, many of you have heard of Zelda and, and Mario and Donkey Kong. He's the best video game developer any, anywhere there, there will ever be. He sold more games. He's made more hit games. And he's like the nicest guy. He's like totally, he's totally chill. Uh, and, he's, and he's not egotistical about it at all. And so I had a chance to work with him for a long time. And one of the things that he taught me was that the skills that you are learning are not game skills. They're life skills and they're transferable. So where I transferred game skills from being an artist to being a game designer to now making tools that will make everyone's lives better and save lives, because not only are we doing things like medical training, we're doing things for soldiers. Like we built a, a trainer uh, that teaches soldiers how to find uh, explosive devices in the field, right? Uh, so that they don't have to actually fly to a base, go through the training there, and then go back to their home station. They can actually train where they are in virtual reality on how to operate their equipment to find explosives. Or in, the, in this case, for this thing I'm going to show you right now, this is actually a pretty cool, uh, if I can get it to come up here. Let's see. Oh, I'll show you the counter IED training. So let's see if I can get this to work. This was actually pretty neat too. We did this really, really fast. Uh, and now they've had us go back and uh, the Marines are using it and the Army's using it. But um, let's see, you actually hold the mind sweeping device in your hands and we track it in real time. So we actually track all the data that the soldier is going through the training. See that, see that thing he's holding right there? That's called a Shia mind, uh, mind detector. And so the person who's doing this is actually holding a real one of these. And the thing you're seeing in virtual reality is mapping one-to-one -one in real time to what he's doing in an empty room. But he's seeing a country lane where we've got a bunch of test objects for him to sweep over and listen to all the tones and the actual Shia vibrates just at the same time as it does inside the game and does all the normal functions. We call that uh, digital mirroring or digital twinning, right? Where we take something in the real world and we map it into the virtual world. And this is using Unity. And some of you guys who were messing around with game development are familiar with the Unity engine. But this is all inside the Unity engine the same thing you guys are working with. And this one took us, I think, three and a half weeks to put together with three of our team members. And we built everything from scratch. I'll stop this. All right, so. And I think there were a couple other things I wanted to, to touch with you. So what I'm kind of getting at is, um, there's no reason you guys shouldn't be more successful than I am. None. People, um, my business, whether it's game development or, or industry or defense consulting, we are desperate for people with your talents, right? You guys right now sitting at home have more skill 
in this area than I did when I started this stuff. And you have better tools at your disposal to be successful at it than I ever did, right? I had to do things the hard way by beating my head against a wall, right? And I had to do it while supporting a family and paying a mortgage and all those things and scrimp and save and my wife working really, really hard. And that kind of gets to the second point I want to make. Surround yourselves with people who will help you succeed, right? The reason I've been successful isn't because I'm hard headed. It's not because I'm particularly smart. It's because I surrounded myself with people who wanted me to succeed. And when I fell down flat on my face, they pick me up, they dust me off, they point me in the right direction, they kick me in the butt and get me going in the direction I need to go, right? That's nine tenths of success. And, and if you look at this screen and all the people on this screen with you, right? These are the people who will be with you, whether they're physically with you or not. They're the people who are gonna be with you in your mind for your entire career when you go into this. I find people right now when, when I have to, um, and this is, you know, people I worked with 20 years ago, if I have something come up in my office where I need someone, I'm like, hey, I wonder what Trevor's up to, right? And this actually happened at my current office. I needed an, a, a, a art lead who knew how to really make good art, good game art. And uh, I used to work with a guy out, uh, out in California named Trevor Grimshaw. And we used to fight all the time. I mean, all the time. Because I was like Mr. Square, you know, kind of nerdy. And Trevor was this edgy artist and stuff. And he, and he argued with everybody, right? And so he and I would butt heads all the freaking time. But he was a good, good artist, right? I'm like, I wonder what Trevor's up to. I could use someone with those skills right now. So I called him up. And I said, hey, Trevor. He said, Mike, man, I hadn't heard from you in like 10 years. I'm like, yeah, I saw that you were looking for a new gig. And I've got this opportunity at my studio, and I'd like you to consider coming out here and working for us. And uh, he did Star Wars Uprising. He did Tomb Raider. He's like an apex artist. You know, he's like right at the top. And he's like, you know, and he was at the point where I was, right, when I started doing this business. I want to do something that change, might make some change and make some, make some last, lasting difference. And uh, he came in and he interviewed and he looked over what we were doing and he signed up. He's been with us two years now, right? I, do, I did that for my, my audio director, worked with me on Donkey Kong. And so people I've worked with for my entire career, I go back to that bank of people. I go back, to, in fact, one of my friends from college is an animator. He used to work for um, Turner uh, Animation down in Atlanta. And he used to do Adult Swim cartoons, right? And uh, cartoon series. I think he did. Um, I'm trying to remember which ones he did. He he did uh, Ed and Eddie. He did um, did like three or four different ones. But anyway, he's a he's a professor of animation now up in Indiana. And now I'm help. He reached back to me, and I'm helping him make a virtual reality film. Ed Ted and Eddie. That's what it is. Ed, Ed, and Eddie, uh, and uh, and a bunch. This reach back that I've got in my career is normal, right? And you guys will experience that as well. Some of you are going to get involved in the business, and you're going to go far, and you're going to be like, "Man, I, I I wish I had, you know, Marcus's skills, or I wish I had, you know, Malik's skills, or George's skills, or or." or Josh's skills or whoever, right? You're gonna reach back and you're gonna go, I wonder what he's doing or I wonder what she's doing. And you're gonna reach out and you're gonna find them at a point in their lives where they're gonna want something different or they're looking for something, they're hungry for something or they wanna learn something new or they just like you. And you'll be able to multiply your skills and your friendships and your, and your acquaintances together to make something truly special. So surround yourselves with people who will amplify your success. And the last thing I want to kind of touch on um, is something that Dr. King was talking about earlier. Uh, I'm not naturally a gifted public speaker, right? I'm not an extrovert. I put it on like a suit. I'm an introvert, 
by nature. I don't particularly like going out and, and talking to people a lot, but I do it a lot and I'm good at it. And I, and I, I think the largest uh, audience I've had is 15,000 people. Uh, and that's because I cheat. And I'm going to teach you guys how to cheat right now. So there's a book you can get and used. You can get it like really, really cheap. Um, and I'm going to share this with you. And uh, it's basically my wife beat me about the head and shoulders until I listened to her. She said, you need this skill. And uh, so let me share this with you. So this is a book called Just Listen by Mark Goulston. And I'm not a, I'm not a big user of like self-help books and stuff. I'm, I, I kind of like learning by doing. But this book got to me in a specific way. It teaches you mechanical skills for how to talk to people. And it's really good for talking to people about creative things or talking to creatives about things called Just Listen. And I recommend either getting the, the book, pick it up used, or get an audio book. It will change your life. It will change how you talk to people. It will it, it'll help change how you work as a professional. It just got good mechanical skills for you to practice. And they're simple to, to start using. Um, one, of the, one of the simplest things, one of the biggest things, is after when someone asks you a question, let it sit for like a second or two before you answer. Even if you've already got the answer in your head, right? And I've got that problem. If someone asks me a question before they finish speaking, I have the answer ready in my head. So I used to talk right over the end of them as they were asking me the question because I knew the answer. Uh, that's a problem because when you do that to people, um, subtextually, subconsciously, they think that you're dissing them, right? They think that you're not listening to their question, that you're not considering it carefully, right? It doesn't matter if your answer is not going to change between, you know, them being almost done with their question and being done with their question. Giving them that extra second or two at the end of the, con at the, end of the question lets them know that you are weighing what they said. And two seconds feels like a long time when it's inside your head. I want each of you to count 1,001, 1,002 inside your head right now. That feels like a long time, doesn't it? Raise your hand if you think that thought sound feels like a long time, right? So now I'm gonna, answer, I'm gonna ask you a question and you don't have to answer by turning off your microphone but I want you to answer aloud. So I'm just seeing your mouths moving. After, answer as soon as I ask the question, then I'm gonna ask it again, another question, and then wait two seconds and answer, okay? What is your favorite breakfast food? Okay, now I want you to wait two seconds after I ask the next question. What is your favorite color? Now think about how you reacted with that, right? So if someone asked me, what is your favorite color? I would go, you know, when I was young, I probably would have said red. But you know, as I've grown up, I kind of like blue. I wear blue things and I wear dark colors, you know? Whereas before, if someone had asked me that, and what's your favorite color? Blue, blue's my favorite color. That's an easy one, obviously I know the answer to that, right? But giving that extra second or two lets people say, oh, he's really weighing what I'm saying. And that creates a rapport between you and the person who's asking the question. Those two seconds increase their desire for them to hear your answer right? It makes them complicit in your answer. It makes them part of your team. And that is the fundamental key to all success in your professional life, right? You want to get the people you're interacting with 
to become romantically involved in your success, right? You want them to conspire with you so that we can all be successful. And once they're on your team conspiring with you for success, everything becomes easier, right? Your life becomes easier, your career becomes easier, the projects you're working on becomes easier, and it all starts with waiting a second or two after someone asks you a question. And those are the kind of simple tools that you can learn from this. And, from, and there's another book called uh, The, um, uh, oh gosh, I'm drawing a total blank. The Charisma Myth, right? The Charisma Myth. And that teaches you how to actually carry yourself in conversations and have conversations and build a charismatic aura around yourself through simple tools. Um, and with that, that kind of ties up my, my presentation. I'm kind of eager to work with you guys. Um, I've got a lot of experience making games and talking about the mechanics of games and how I construct and how I think about solving problems with games. And what I would like to do is I'd like to open up the floor uh, to questions. And it can be any question you like. It could be about game development, you know, how tall was Shigeru Miyamoto? Um, what was my favorite game I did? How do I do this? How do I do that? What crazy things have I worked on? Anything you can think of, right? Where have I lived? How many languages do I speak? Blah, blah, blah. Anything you like. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you, if you have a question, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and then I'll call you out by name and then you can, un you can unmute yourself. Oop, I see I have chat bubbles. See. Okay. Um, uh, then I'll, then you unmute and ask me the question and I'll answer it. So does anyone, oh, Dr. King, you have a question. Uh, Mike, did you get a chance to see our heart rate again? I did. Uh, can you give us any feedback about that? Yes, question? actually, I'll, I'll give you some very simple feedback, right? I, I, a, I thought it was great, but you've got to remember in virtual reality, most headsets don't have a very granular pixel rate. So a lot of people have a hard time reading text what I would do is I would simplify your interface a little bit, right? And go through a few steps for, for, for interface simplification. Take a look at your text, fewer words per bubble. It's okay to have more bubbles and let people click through it, right? And it's okay to let people dwell and have time in a product, particularly in virtual reality. It's such a new technology. People love playing with it, right? So let it be a little bit more expansive, you know? Give people a little bit more time to play and time to, do. but I think it's an absolutely great, uh, great start application. Uh, but that, th those are some simple things I'd go at. And, and I mean to actually do a write up for you and I'll, and I'll send it over to you. Any, next question. Oh, come on. It could be embarrassing. Oh, there we go, Andre, unmute. Uh, how long did it take you to uh, make Donkey Kong Returns? Oh, that's a great question. And that's actually really cool and something I'm really proud of. So none of us on that game had ever made a side-scrolling platformer before. None of us, right? So after we'd done Metroid Prime 3 and it was a success, Miyamoto said, hey, we would like to give you this next franchise. And for them, that's like a huge deal, right? Because no one had ever made a Donkey Kong game, uh, a side-scrolling Donkey Kong game. Um, except Nintendo. They had done a 3D one back in the day, uh, Don, uh, but they hadn't done one like that before. And so we panicked, right? We went into full-on panic mode. We're like, how the heck? So we went and we played the original Donkey Kong Country, which, you know, I don't know if any of you guys have ever seen it, but it's a murderously hard game, right? It is just, we played it and we're like, we can't make a game like this because people will put it down. They'll never play it because they'll die like every 30 seconds. So we went back and, uh, and this is a really important thing to learn when you're making games. Um, we were re-envisioning a classic game title, right? So, in order to do that, I've had to do it a number of times in my career. You want to make people feel like they felt when they first played the classic game, right? It's not about making the exact kind of game they made before. It's making modern people feel like they felt when those people first played those games. So we went back and figured out what are the core three pillars 
that made Donkey Kong successful. And uh, we took those and we built our own versions of those pillars about crispness of, of speed, about the depth of the 3D, and about the pacing of Donkey Kong and his momentum, right? So we spent like six months just working on Donkey Kong. And Donkey Kong himself had 350 separate animations to make him. And we ran him at 60 frames per second. So it was crisp. The control was crisp. You always knew what you were doing. And he was far enough into the screen at the speed he was moving so you could see what was coming up next. Once we had that, we built the rest of the game. So the whole game took us 20 months, two zero months to make from beginning to final mastering. And in that time, we built 120 uh, levels and 150 enemies and 12 bosses and scored the music and none of us had ever done it before. So it was totally new. Did that answer your question or do you have any follow up? Yeah, I did. Uh, I was just asking because I think I have it upstairs and I liked it. It was fun. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Next question. Come on, guys. Anybody? Hugh has, has, has a question. Oh. Who does? Hugh and Norbin. Okay, Hugh. We'll do Hugh then Norbin. And Marcus had a question too. Okay, Hugh, Norbin, and Marcus. Oh, I I, don't, uh, I can't see everybody there. Okay, got it. Do you know about Do you know about gaming consoles? Yes. In fact, I helped design the Wii console for uh, Nintendo. What's the best? Do you think PS4 or Xbox is better? Well, in the PS4 generation, the PS4 is better than the Xbox. It, hard, hardware wise, it's a better platform. Um, from the underpinning technology to render technology, the graphic chipset, the PlayStation 4 is, um, is superior. Now, I say that with a caveat, right? So it's about the games, man, right? So and there's a bigger context. We call it the console wars in the video game business, right? Every generation. You know, Sony and Microsoft getting this big slap fight over PlayStation versus Xbox. And Nintendo's over here doing its own crazy thing. Now, Nintendo doesn't feel like it's in competition with Sony and Microsoft because it's not. Sony and Microsoft are in a competition for boys between the ages of 12 and 25. That's who they're fighting over, right? So Nintendo wants everyone to play games. And so all their games are designed for you to play whether you're six or whether you're 90. So Nintendo feels like, let them fight over the boys between ages of 12 and 25. We'll just play with everybody else. So having said that, my recommendation to you is whichever console has the games you like is the correct answer, right? Um, I've got lots of friends who work for Microsoft and Microsoft Publishing and Microsoft Console Development. I got lots of friends who work at, at Sony uh, I know like half the God of War team, they gave me this really boss uh, hand signed poster of the newest God of War. It's like this big where the whole team signed it. In fact, I'll, sh I'll show you. So I get stuff like that. Like whenever I ship a game, I don't know if you can see this. Um, and I don't know if you can see the signatures. But whenever we ship a game, the last thing that we actually do is we do something like this for every single member. We do an archival framing of the shipped game and everybody on the team who participated. So I've got a wall in my office with every single product like that, as well as big sign posters from friends of mine over the years who've gone on to other teams and who are working on different consoles. So it's all about the games. Uh, I, that was a long-winded answer, but uh, that's as good as I got. Okay, who was next? Siobhan, I might let you arbitrate. Okay, it's Norman next. Norman. Yeah. Norman. Um, oh, sorry, Norman. Off, first, yeah, first, thank you. Uh, first, I wanted to say I played Donkey Kong for like years. That game's so fun <laughs> on Wii. And then, um, what, what were you originally going to major in and like your plan after you went to art school? Well, I'm in, that's a great question. So I, I've got a Bachelor of Fine Arts in illustration. So I was an illustrator, which means that um, I've got a little bit of architecture training so I can do architectural illustration. I could do um, 
uh, my love is pen and ink. I love working in pen and ink. There's something about the cleanness of a pen, pen line. And I'm really good at drawing in three dimensions and two and three point perspective. I can do that all freehand. That's my stupid human trick. I can draw in, in perfect perspective without pencil lines in, in just ink, right? So I was gonna be an illustrator. I was gonna illustrate things, illustrate textbooks, illustrate you know, children's books, adult books, you know, all this sort of stuff. And then I also knew how to paint and airbrush and do all that sort of stuff. So I was gonna be a classically trained artist. I was gonna work in the art field doing art things. The problem is there are a lot of artists out there and that is the hardest job in the universe to make a living at. When they say starving artist, they mean starving artist, right? And um, it became readily apparent to me. And, and back when I went to, to college, I had a knockdown drag out with my dad, my dad, the colonel, about you're throwing your life away, son. You know, you, artist, you know, you'll never make a living being an artist. Well, he was almost correct. If, if I hadn't gone into video games and turned my art career into that, I probably could never have made a full-time job of being an artist. I mean, I'm good at certain things. Uh, I'm better than a lot of artists, but I'm not as good as a lot of them. So I'm sort of middle of the pack. But I turned all the skills I had into something a little bit better than just being an illustrator. Uh, does that answer what you question or? Yeah, what? and then I had another question as well. Okay, real quick. Um, what do you think the best way to find new people to add to your network is? I'm like, how should you approach them? Well, uh, a couple different ways. First of all, and this is, this is some serious advice, get yourself a free LinkedIn account, right? And build it professionally and build it as if you've already graduated from college, right? Say the minimum, you know, and, and, and go in there and start studying the people that you're linked to because what I expect is I expect each of you to go build your own LinkedIn account. You all have email addresses, right? So you can do this. Build yourself a LinkedIn account and connect to me. Because I'm a mover and shaker. I know everybody in this business. I know the head of, head of Sony on down, had a Microsoft on down, had a Nintendo on down, had a Sega on down. And I'm connected with every game industry and every defense industry consultant in this area in the world, right? And so you guys are gonna start off with a connection, being me, who is linked to everyone of any importance in this entire career from the get-go. And then you're gonna go in and you're gonna to go to everyone's profile that you're interested in. You're gonna surf through and you're gonna look at how these successful people have constructed their connections. So that's one layer, right? It's all in who you know. The second layer is you've already got your core group here right? So you start going to places that like, if you're interested in games, go to gamasutra.com and start reading the articles and going to the forums and going to the developer forums and read up on what these people are working on and what they're, what they're struggling with and how they're prototyping and where they're having their successes, right? Get on mailing lists and forums and groups and find games that you like and figure out who made them, right? And figure out who did the hard work on them, you know? If you're an artist, figure out, oh man, I love this game. Who was the art lead on that? And who were the artists who made these environments? Oh man, they've got their own web page. Holy cow, look at these art, you know, this art. I'm gonna leave a note on their page saying, man, I really appreciate the work you've done here, blah, blah, blah. That's how you build your network. That's how I built my network. I mean, I've, I think I've got uh, 5,000 connections on LinkedIn and I probably know three, four times that many people in the game industry just from, you know, connections back and forth. That's how you do it, right? It has to be a personal discussion and a personal contact. Is that good? Yes, sir. Thank you. Oh, no problem. And call me Mike. Siobhan, who's next? I didn't see anyone else. It might have been Caleb. Marcus. Oh, Marcus. Nope. Yeah, Caleb oh, I have a Marcus. question. Oh, Luke. It's Mar Marcus and then Lewis. Okay. And, K and Caleb, did you have one too? I thought I saw your hand up earlier. Okay, so Marcus, let's do Marcus first, then we'll do Lewis and Caleb if he's if he's got one. Okay, Marcus. Are you like the lead in all of those games? Like, are you in charge? 
Uh, yes, in those games, I was either the lead designer or the creative director. Is that it? Would you like me to break down what that rule means? Because okay. those are just words. I think you should. <laughs> okay. So we'll start with lead game designer. Okay. So a game designer's role uh, depends on the size of the team that you're on, right? So a big game like Call of Duty might have 250 people on the team, right? And so there might be 50 game designers on your team. At that point, the lead game designer's role is to manage the designers, right? And to, to have some control of the overall design. That means he's like, this game is gonna be broadly like this, right? So the bigger your team, the less control you have over the small stuff. And the more control that the individual designers have over their narrow slice of game design. That's why you see guys who are level designers now and combat designers and very specified kinds of things. Um, uh, in the old days when dinosaurs roamed the earth, um, a game designer was a much broader job because our teams were smaller. So for example, and this is actually a useful illustration. So Metroid Prime 1 is still in the top 10 video games of all time that anyone's ever made. Um, I was uh, a designer for, which is a senior slash lead game designer. And I designed the overall game idea. I designed all the bosses, all the enemies. Uh, and I scripted by hand 90% of the actual gameplay, right? So anytime you go into a room, anytime you're fighting an enemy or whatever, I actually went in and hand tweaked every variable on that for a 25 hour game for that experience. And it took me three years of work to make that game. So I was lead on that. Now, by the time we got to Metroid Prime 3, we had a bigger staff and we had six game designers on the team. So rather than doing all that stuff, I did the overall overarching game design, designed most of the bosses and most of the enemies and one of the world sections, right? So my focus broadened somewhat and my actual workload narrowed somewhat because what we were trying to do was more complex and I had more hands to help me, which also meant that in the first game, the last nine months of production, I averaged 117 hours a week working. Whereas in Metroid Prime 3, I averaged about 55 to 60 hours a week working, which is much more reasonable. And my wife wasn't ready to throw me out of the house. Um, at Booz Allen Hamilton, I'm creative director, which means I'm even more hands off. But what I do is I shape the overall uh, development of the products that we create, as well as the business case. So I do a lot of actual flying out, talking to clients, meeting with them. I just flew out to 29 Palms, California, for example, and met with the Marine Corps. And they're interested in doing some stuff with us, some really cool, cool stuff. And some of it's classified. Like someone actually gave me a security clearance. It's crazy town. Um, but as creative director, my role has now gone beyond just making the game to overall business management and strategic development for the company. Hope that answered your question. Okay, was Lewis next? Yep, Lewis is next. Oh, yeah, I have a question. So um, before I got into like all my cybersecurity stuff, uh, when I was like really, really young, I started making games and um, I used Unreal Engine and Unity uh, back and forth. What do you think would be better if like somebody were to start somewhere to make games and they already have like a past experience? Do you think Unreal would be better or Unity still? That is a superb question because I just, I actually just answered that question in a document to the federal government on Thursday. <laughs> uh, the, the, the answer is they're both very different tools for different purposes, even though they're both game engines and superficially you think they're similar. Um, it really depends what you want to do. So Unreal is designed to reward 
high-end visual graphic performance, right? So you, in an Unreal Engine game, you can make the best looking game. It's gonna be just, just gonna be so realistic or so fantastic because you've got access to a lot more capabilities and a render engine that can handle a lot more complexity than Unity can uh, with a lot less effort. Um, that's good and that's bad, right? So from the good aspect, if you're gonna be running on a PlayStation 4 or 5 or the newest Xbox or a high-end PC, Unreal is the way to go, right? You're, and you have a good art team, right? That's another caveat. If you've got an art team that can take advantage of the power of the Unreal Engine, then that's the way to go, right? If that's where you want to aim your career, right? Uh, and, that's a, and that's a fair slice of the game industry. Now, most of the game industry right now, for good or ill, is like phone games, right? So most of the jobs that come available are small studios making phone games. It's not my bag, right? I, I'm, I'm not a big fan of making phone games myself, and I play a few. But um, Unreal is almost useless on the phone, right? It's got a big install footprint. It's got a... Um, it's got the performance package that runs the engine sucks up a lot of phone memory, right? So you're not going to get a lot of good performance out of it. So Unity is a better tool for doing mid-range PCs, mobile development, and general development, right? It's just a good solid tool set with a lot of tricks. And if you've got a good art team, you can actually push Unity to become really, really good. It just doesn't have all quite the same number of high-end advantages that Unreal does. So from my perspective, if you're looking for an entry-level job, Unity is the way to go, right? Because there's going to be more jobs available. It's easy for you to create your own content. I can sit in a garage and make a game myself in Unity, you know, in a few weeks, right? You can't do that nearly as easily with Unreal. And then secondarily, um, Unity's got a better marketplace, right? So let's say you, you like programming and stuff, but you're not a very good artist. Unity's got, uh, while both Unity and Unreal have a marketplace where you can buy cheap models and stuff, Unity's is by far bigger, cheaper, better, right? So if you if you have a small team of a couple guys where it's just you, uh, you can go and buy assets in Unity and make them work in your game and create content. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Caleb, did you have anything? Um, I was wondering what it was like working to make, uh, you know, a sequel to these giant games like, you know, Doom and Donkey Kong, what it was like going off the originals. It was scary, right? And, and, I'll, and I'll actually tell you a story that encapsulates how I feel each and every time, right? So for some strange reason, I've had to do Duke Nukem, I've had to do Metroid, I've had to do Donkey Kong, and I've had to do Doom, right? Uh, all of those games, the original ones, were huge, were stupidly huge, right? And so what that means is every fan in the universe uh, is now looking at you to drop the ball, right? So um, Metroid is probably the best example of, of how all that went. I was too dumb when I did Duke Nukem to realize the, the, the true terror. I just thought of it, oh, this is cool. We're going to make a Duke Nukem game. But when I came to Metroid, uh, when they announced that an American studio was going to be making the Metroid game, the fan reaction was really bad, right? They're like, oh, they're going to screw it up. This no-name studio in Texas, they're going to it's they're going to destroy the Metroid franchise. It's the end of the world. And I'll tell you how we got there because it's an interesting story. I had taken the job. Uh, I had been working out in Accolade for a number of years doing a giant robot game. Uh, and they got bought out by a French company. And so I ended up taking a job with this startup studio in, in Austin, Texas called Retro Studios. Mm. And um, as a lead designer. And uh, they were working on a original property, first person shooter called Metaforce, right? It was their own original idea. And um, they were making their own game engine. And I came in and took the job and um, realized I'd gotten myself into a little bit of trouble, right? 
their engine wasn't far enough along. Uh, they had this. They were. They had four teams making games. They had a football team, a car combat team, a fantasy role playing game team, and Metaforce. And this engine that they were making with a separate team inside the company was supposed to run all those games magically, right? It wasn't like Unreal, which is a proven veteran game engine. They were going to make their own engine that would magically run these four completely different game ideas. And they were, or they had been doing it for two years and they still didn't have a working engine yet. And um, I'm a big believer in iteration from game development, game design. So I believe in playing with things and testing it over and over. And when you're re-envisioning a property, that's really critical, right? Because like I said before, it's about making people feel the way they felt when they played the original game. Um, at first, I didn't have that problem because we were doing an original IP property. Right. So we, I didn't have to make people feel a specific way at all. Uh, but I knew that unless we had a way to create content in the engine, I wasn't going to be able to get any gameplay for sure the way I wanted it. So I convinced my engineers on my team to branch the code of our own version of the game engine. And we wrote a little editor where we could actually script stuff so that we could play test and prototype gameplay. And then I went to the other leads and, think, and said, hey, we've got a version of an editor up that in the interim, until the, the engine team ever delivers something, that you can at least create content and get ahead of the game, right, with something demonstrable. And uh, the other teams were like, no, no, we don't want that. We'll wait. So we started making gameplay, right? We had enemies moving around. We had environments. I had this whole uh, Mesa in Arizona, that the whole top was a secret U.S. military base to fight the alien invaders and all, you know, crash flying saucers and stuff on fire. And um, Nintendo showed up with no warning, right, out of the blue. They said, we want to see all your games. You're way behind schedule. And so they went to, they took each of the leads and brought them into the front office. And we were the last ones, right? So the three other teams sent their leads in and the leads came out with their heads hanging down. They were torn apart. This was Miyamoto-san, this was Tanabe-san, this was all the, the heavy brass from Nintendo, right? And because they had no game demonstrable, they showed them screenshots, they showed them art, they showed them all this stuff, but they didn't have any game, right? Mm -hmm. So we go in and we have game and we have an editor and we showed them how we make game and we push it out with the editor and it shows up in engine and they're all sitting there and they got really quiet. Now the, the weird thing about working with the Japanese is um, that they very rarely ever say anything positive. It's not because mm -hmm. they don't think that something's positive. It's because if they don't say anything, that means you're doing it right. Right? So the only comments you got, is when they disagree with you. So they all sat in there and Miyamoto-san and Iwata-san and all those guys are sitting there and they're like, just stone-faced, right? And I didn't know this. Like, I'm this artist who's now making games and the most legendary figure in all of video games is sitting across from me going like this. I thought I was doomed, right? I thought I was, I thought I was over, right? So we go back and then like an hour later, we get a call like, Mike, you know, Mike, would you come back to the office? I'm like, oh man, I'm going to come back and they're going to fire us. Right? <laughs> because we, you know, and, and I'm like, oh, that's why all the other guys were hanging their heads. You know, what do we do? Do we offend me or whatever? And they come in, they're like, we very much like what we saw. How would you like to do Metroid? Almost those exact words. And it was like a total disconnect, right? You could, they could have been talking, you know, Russian to me at that point. I couldn't process what they were saying. And I'm like, because Metroid was a side, the original Metroid was a side scrolling jumping puzzle game like Donkey Kong, right? Except science fiction, kind of like Alien. And, um, and I'm like, at first I was a little bit offended, right? Because they're asking me to stop making this first person action science fiction game I've been designing and go make a side-scrolling jumping puzzle game. 
I'm not complaining mm-hmm. because I still have a job apparently, but I was a little bit upset that they were going to change it so thoroughly. So I asked Miyamoto-san, I'm like, do you mean for us to not do a first person game and do a side scrolling game? Like he said, no, no, no. We love your game. He said that he said, we love your game, but we want to make it into a Metroid game instead. Really? <laughs> right. And, uh, you part of my dogs in the background. Um, and at that moment, the crushing weight of it came down. The most legendary video game developer in all of video game history, Shigeru Miyamoto, has now asked me to take one of the core Nintendo properties and make it into a kind of game that it's never been before. You know, don't screw it up. Right? Yeah. So, it took, so we went in and we went in and we gamed it out, right? So we went and we took all our core team and we took the original Metroid games and we deconstructed them, right? We went back. What made these people feel like this? What made us feel like this when we were kids playing it, right? What are the, the isolation? Isolation was a big deal. Samus has to be isolated. She has to be alone on an alien planet. It has to be deadly. It has to be quick and twitch at certain times, but it has to be broad enough that you can explore without being in peril every moment, right? It has to give you time to breathe. And then how do we do that with game loading and stuff? So then we had to construct a whole architecture. Um, and, and if any of you have ever played Metroid Prime, I, I think it's still available on the Wii U. And I think they're going to re-release it on the Switch and, and Metroid 4 is about to come out. Uh, Retro is finally doing a sequel to it. I uh, highly recommend you play it because it's got a few really interesting things. We never, other than the very first load of the game, you never see a loading screen in the game, right? Because whenever you're taking an elevator between levels or you're moving between rooms, we're hiding all the loading behind the game, right? We were the first people to really do that. Now I see it all the time, right? I was playing uh, Jedi Fallen Order on PlayStation 4 the other day. And there, it, it's exactly the way we did it, right? You might as well have taken Metroid, Metroid Prime and said, okay, we're going to actually load it full of Star Wars stuff, and here we go. So, but at the time, no one had ever done a game that was 25 hours long that never had a load screen. It never loaded. Uh, so we just constructed the whole game to support the feeling of isolation, never breaking you out. If you, di- if you didn't put up the controller, you could play from the very beginning to the very end without ever seeing a loading screen so that it made it all one contextual experience. I know I got a little bit off topic. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and Mike, yeah. This is, this is great, but we're running even more behind now. I'd like to... <laughs> okay. uh, I know that we've talked about uh, the cooperation with uh, Future Kings and, and Booth. Would you be able to come back and, and continue this sometime? Of course. Okay. So uh, we, they got a break. Uh, they got a break. Get ready for their uh, technical sessions now. But I think I speak for everybody by saying we've been kind of mem- mesmerized by hearing your stories. We certainly want to hear, hear more. Uh, the things that we have planned for our virtual reality games and our other games are all going to be cross-curricular, meaning that uh, we like to blend in all of our technical specialties. The first ones that we have right now is biomedical sciences, but having them with science, uh, with, with the uh, engineering and cybersecurity as well is something we want to put on the to-do list. So we would love for you to come back and, and uh, help us through some of the mechanics of Absolutely. taking our games from where they are to where they need to be. Uh, so uh, with that, if you don't mind, we'll just kind of break this up. And i like all the guys, will you please wave the mic and say thank you very much? Thank Remember, you. LinkedIn accounts, guys. I expect to see thank invites you. by the end of the weekend. Yeah, That's and, and for you guys who don't know what LinkedIn is, we'll talk about it later. But... LinkedIn is, for lack of a better description, I'll call it the adult version of Facebook. Okay, and so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk to you about that and, and start with that. Okay. All right. Uh, Thank the answer is great. We're looking forward to working with you some more. You guys, I'm sorry that.